But now we go in depth on our major story. Continued shock waves reverberating around the Beltway in Washington as the number two Republican in the House was upset in the GOP primary in Virginia's seventh district last night with more on the aftermath, the fallout, and how it affects the midterms. Matt Kibbe, the president and CEO of Freedom Works and the author of the book, Don't Hurt People and Take Their Stuff. Matt Kibbe, you've been here with us on set before. We welcome you back to America's Forum. Good to be with you, J.D. Uh, so, Matt, give us uh, your insights. How can you describe what happened last night? Well, welcome to the new rules of politics. I think this is uh, what, what I call political disintermediation. The advantages of incumbency, the advantages of being a really powerful guy in Washington, D.C., are dissipating and being replaced with grassroots on the ground. I think this is a very clear trend that's been going on since at least 2008. And it happened in Democratic politics, I think, before Republican politics. But you're going to see more and more of this. And it's got to be a combination of authenticity coming from a serious candidate combined with actual grassroots on the ground doing that hard work. That beats money and power today in certain instances. And I think it's going to happen more and more. All right, so Matt, let me ask you about this one because we just talked also about the South Carolina result here and Lindsey Graham, a guy who, who could be the poster boy for the GOP establishment in some folks' eyes. A anyway, he won big time facing off against a, new, a number of Tea Party favorites. Is this something that's a, a one-off in South Carolina or, or is there just a real diversion in what's happening here between the Tea Party and the establishment in, in terms of voters? Well, there, the element of surprise is pretty useful when you're going after someone with an infinite amount of resources. And we saw the same thing in Kentucky, where Mitch McConnell spent upwards of $10 million in a relatively small media market. I do think that that matters. Um, what, what Lindsey Graham did very effectively was to convince the serious candidates that could have beaten him not to run. And what you saw was a very large field of, of relatively new, unknown, unfunded candidates trying to take him down. And you, it's hard to beat something with nothing. And there's a lot of practical elements here. And this is part of what the, what the Tea Party and the grassroots are figuring out. We have to build our farm team. We have to build um, the talent that can actually take on in, in a, in an entrenched incumbent like this. And we didn't get it done in South Carolina. Uh, so with all the people running down there, you had fragmentation that did not allow for the discombobulation. Of, uh, of Lindsey Graham. That, that's just the basically political physics. But I want to return to Virginia 7 because there are some other ingredients here. Dave Brad, you know, you can take a look at what Eric did and in terms of what I've seen as a political MO, he had the money to try and define Dave Brad and he tried to hang it on Brad being part of an economic commission advising a Democrat governor that Brad was able to counteract. And, and the grassroots was just motivated to vote. But the other thing is that Brett has not served in public office, has not run for office before, so his outsider status made him that much stronger. And uh, from my perspective, that's why Cantor could not demonize or define him the way Cantor had hoped. How much did the, the newcomer factor figure in the Dave Brett win? Oh, I think it's I think it's a big part of it, and I think it's a healthy skepticism coming from grassroots America. They look at Washington and incumbents generally and say, you know what, it's not working. We need to shake up senior management. That's exactly what they did. You know, I would I would point out that Dave Bratt is a professor, and he's published, and and knowing where he's coming from on issues is not as as hard as it would be with with someone that that hasn't really expressed opinions about ideas and values and and public policy in the past, the playbook for the incumbents is quite clear. Smear your opponent. It's typically personal attacks, and, and Cantor couldn't do that here. Matt, in a lot of ways, you could say that the, the real uh, opportunity for the Tea Party here begins now uh, with Dave Bratt likely going to Washington and certainly will have a, a big voice because of his popularity and now his rising status within you know the more conservative branches of the Republican Party here. What do we need to see from him to make sure this momentum continues here, if, if that momentum really is there for the Tea Party? You know, I, th I think he has a potential to be a policy leader. And one of the things that's missing from the GOP, and you see this in the immigration debate, 
is that the Republican leadership hasn't been offering serious alternatives to what Harry Reid and the Democrats are, are proposing in the Senate. And I, I, what I'd like to see from Dave Bratt and some of these other legislative entrepreneurs coming in is uh, pick an issue, own it, and develop a serious set of ideas. Because right now, fairly or not, the Democrats and some of the establishment Republicans have been trashing the insurgents, saying, you, you, you don't stand for anything. I don't think that's true. But the burden of conservative uh, governance, of actually fixing problems like Obamacare, is very real. And I think we should own that. Yeah, I think one of the differences here between 2010 and, and right now is that a lot of these folks are saying, what do you got? We, we have Obamacare, we have uh, what's happening with the immigration system, now we need some sort of alternative here, um, whether it's securing the borders, but putting those ideas down on paper, much like what we saw with the Contract America, something to that effect. So, Matt, do you expect Dave, since immigration was the defining issue, do you expect uh, Dave Bratt to focus his attention there? Or as an economics professor, he certainly has any number of projects, but it seems that he, he, he rode this immigration issue, so that would be the natural place to concentrate his, his policy initiatives. Yeah, I, I think that's an opportunity. He has a lot of opportunities, like you've pointed out, and, and there's no reason why he can't weigh in on a number of issues. I think we're, you know, we're electing other people that essentially will, will add to the Mike Lee wing of the Republican Party, and by that I mean the thinkers, the guys that are actually sitting down with legislative council and trying to figure out how to solve problems. We've done that since 2010. And I think, you know, immigration is a classic example of um, we need to scrap all of this, all of this Dick Durbin style so-called reform and come up with serious ideas. We didn't get that from Republican leadership, but that doesn't mean that we don't have good ideas. Well, let, let's get an idea of the support for, uh, for Dave Bratt. Heretofore, it was basically hands off. When Mr. Brad sets foot in Washington, a whole lot of people are going to try to line up and become his new best mm. friend. And, and it is worth noting, in the spirit of full disclosure and, and candor, that a lot of Tea Party groups basically stayed away from Brad in the primary because they were concerned about Eric Cantor as the majority leader and the influence that Cantor had. So. Now, do you see the return of, uh, of the Tea Party groups to help uh, Brett down the home stretch here? Oh, I, I think they'll all be with him and uh, there'll be a partnership like that. And remember, what's different today is we're sending Dave Bratt to a Washington where he's going to have friends. He's going to have allies. It's almost like a buddy system on the House floor. It really is difficult, if not impossible, to be a lone reformer in Washington because the bad guys surround you. But we now have a coalition both inside inside the legislature, but also the outside groups, and frankly, the people back in his district that got him elected. This is a whole new dynamic, this inside-outside game. Even We didn't even have this, I don't think, in 1994, which was more, more of an inside takeover of failed Republican leadership. This is an outside turning out of failed leadership, and I think that's more sustainable. Well, Matt, one last question for you. We saw this shocker last night in Virginia. As we look ahead, uh, there are some other races where the establishment candidate or the incumbent might be feeling a little bit more comfortable, maybe less comfortable today, but do you see any other big shockers out there on the primary calendar? Well, the, I don't think it's going to be a shocker because I think everybody knows at this point uh, that Chris McDaniel is probably likely to win in Mississippi. We're not taking any of that for granted. Um, in fact, I'll be going to Mississippi tomorrow to work with the activists on the ground. That machine is there. That's the big one. And at some point, uh, fairly soon, we pivot to the general election. And I think it's pretty important. And I think everyone would agree that we, we do need to fire Harry Reid. And we do need to focus accountability on the Democrats that, that jammed Obamacare down our throats that have been the architects of this failed e economy. And in the minute and a half that remains, the politics within the House of Representatives. Now does John Boehner at long last back off that amnesty deal and back off this, this, uh, this flirtation with the, the edicts of the Chamber of Commerce, at least through the midterms? Well, you know, the question is, is, he, is John Boehner interested in being speaker in the next Congress? A lot of people believe, myself included, that he's a short timer. The problem he has now is getting any other Republicans to work with him on some sort of inside deal, whether it's in a lame duck session 
for. I've, I've also heard rumors about doing this early next year. I think this changes everything. In that vacuum is an opportunity for real ideas, and I think it's gonna come from the bottom up. You've seen the power of the speakership dissipate over the last three or four years, in large part because of the grassroots. That continues to be the case. Matt Kibbe, President and CEO of Freedom Works. We thank you for being with us to offer your insights on this political earthquake that emanated from Virginia's 7th District. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. So, Matt Kibbe has his thoughts, and one of them being, gee, does John Baker, uh, John Boehner even want to stay in leadership as Speaker of the House? Is the Speaker listening? What do you think? Why don't you send us your comments at Newsmax TV, hashtag America's Forum. There's also email and Facebook, and we're coming back.